morning students so today we are continuing with the discussion on amenorrhea the topic which we had uh, one class earlier so today we are discussing the special investigations in primary amenorrhea the special investigations uh, it means that the routine investigations you all know like hb tlc dlc urine complete all that those routine investigations they will be done followed by certain special investigations to reach the cause and of course that further it will help us in the further management of the case now if it is a case of mullerian urgenesis now what are the investigations which will be useful they will be like we are going to do an ultrasound we are going to do laparoscopy diagnostic laparoscopy that means then karyotyping then intravenous pyelography that will be done now what happens is that there are so many causes of primary amenorrhea there are many causes so if we have to reach a proper diagnosis only then we are going to further manage the case and therefore certain investigations are very important which we have to undergo to just to reach uh, to clinch the diagnosis now if it is a case of mullerian urgenesis you are doing the ultrasound you are going to find that the uterus is absent the fallopian tubes may be present the ovaries will be normal now you are doing the karyotyping that we will find that it is 46 xx and intravenous pyelography you might also do just to detect if there is any urinary tract abnormalities also what happens is that if it's a case of mullerian urgenesis because the development of the mullerian system and the uh, urinary tract the development it's almost on simultaneously the development occurs usually if there is any abnormality of the mullerian system the urinary tract may also be involved so when you do the ivp we can detect the urinary tract abnormalities then the second cause is the unresponsive endometrium that is also a very important cause of amenorrhea and usually this is a problem in cases of uh, secondary amenorrhea but primary amenorrhea also has this problem here we are going the investigations which will be helpful will be the progesterone challenge test the hysterosalpingography hysteroscopy and the hormonal studies now as you can make out from the name that it is an unresponsive endometrium the endometrium is not going to respond to the hormones the ovarian hormones that is fsh lh although it is released it's going to release the ovarian hormones they are not estrogens and progesterones they are not acting over the i mean they are acting over the endometrium but it is not responding so if the estrogens or the progesterones which are there in sufficient amount they are not acting on the endometrium that means the endometrium is refractory and uh, that can be diagnosed by doing a progesterone challenge test now here what we are doing actually it is that exogenous progesterones are given exogenous progesterone so it can be norethisterone it can be regesterone there are so many exogenous preparations of progesterone available which are going to act over the endometrium and if the endometrium is not responding there will be no withdrawal bleeding so a routine dose of norethisterone which is given in uh, divided doses for 5 days or regestron cr or regestron plain 10 mg it is given tds for 5 days after that the routinely the uh, uterine endometrium it should start menstruating but if it does not that means the progesterone challenge test is negative if we are doing the hysterosalpingography we will find that the uterus is normal the fallopian tubes are normal the cervix is normal everything is okay so the structural abnormality is not there but the functioning of the endometrium is not good so the hysterosalpingography will show it's normal if you do a diagnostic hysteroscopy that will also show us that everything is in control hormonal studies if you are going to do that means you are going to 
test for the FSH, the LH, the estrogens, the progesterones. The, if you are going to test these hormones, the number of the amount will be perfectly normal. That is what happens in case of an unresponsive endometrium. Now, investigations in case of a uterine synechia formation. Now, uterine synechia formation, if you are going to do the progesterone challenge test, you will find it is negative. That means the progesterones which you are giving exogenously in divided doses for 3 to 5 days will not cause any withdrawal bleeding. So, that means that is progesterone challenge test is negative. Then, if you are going to do hysterosalpingography, the hysterosalpingography will show us a honeycomb appearance. Now, this honeycomb appearance is due to the various synechia formation occurring and uh, the synechia formation is going to get, it is attached or adherent with the anterior and the posterior walls and that will give it a honeycomb appearance. Hysteroscopy when you are doing that means the laparoscope which we have endoscope which we have introduced per uh, cervical canal through the cervical canal into to directly visualize the uterine cavity you are going to directly visualize those synechia formation. Tubercular case now tuberculosis is a very common problem in developing country like India and there as the incidence is very high the chances of a woman coming to you in the OPD the chances of her having contracted tuberculosis in childhood or any time during her life are very high and if she had genital tuberculosis that can be an important cause of urbanuria and if the genital genital I mean the external genitals and the internal genitals they are involved what are the findings which we find on investigations? X-ray chest, that is of course you might have a positive finding if it is a recent case of tuberculosis. Montux test will be positive. Then uh, this ECR, ESR that will be raised. And if you do an endometrial biopsy that is used for diagnosis, that will show us a positive tubercular lesion. So if there is a positive tubercular lesion, that means it is it is strongly indicative of a tubercular case and tuberculosis causes a lot of problems structural deformities in the fallopian tubes in the uterus which may cause the amenorrhea now the fallopian tubes of course if there is problem in the fallopian tubes that usually is a cause of infertility and if the endometrium is involved that will cause amenorrhea so side by side you will have the woman having the phase of either primary amenorrhea or secondary amenorrhea plus the fallopian tubes if they are involved she can be having infertility also. Now if it's a case of hypogonadotrophic hypogonadism that can also be a cause of amenorrhea in which the progesterone challenge test it will be negative. The progesterone challenge test if it is negative that means that again if you have given the exogenous progesterones that is not acting that is not causing any response in the endometrium and you will have a negative progesterone challenge test if you do the serum gonadotrophin level examination you will find that the levels are low it is usually less than 5 milliequivalent per liter serum estradiol levels will also be low less than 20 pg per ml so, if the serum gonadotrophins are low, you can safely say it's a case of hypogonadotrophic hypogonadism. Now, gonadotrophins means FSH and LH. So, FSH, LH levels, if they are less, that means it's hypogonadotrophic gonad hypogonadism. If the serum gonadotrophins are less than normal, they are not going to cause the sufficient uh, stimulation of the ovaries and the estrogen progesterone levels they will also be which will be released are also be, uh, be low. Now primary ovarian failure that's another problem in which the karyotyping is 46xx. The serum estradiol levels they are low that is less than 20 pg per ml. 
serum gonadotrophin levels will be elevated more than 40 milli units per milliliter. Now what happens is that in a case of primary ovarian failure, the ovaries fail to respond to the gonadotrophins. So what you say that it's kind of that ovarian tissue has become refractory just like endometrium was refractory and it was not responding. Now primary ovarian failure, the ovarian tissue is not responding even if the gonadotrophin levels, they are getting elevated. It's nature's way of acting. So if the normal levels of gonadotrophins, they are not producing any stimulus or not stimulating the ovarians to the optimal levels or we can say if there is no stimulation, the gonadotrophin release, it is slowly getting elevated, getting increased so as to cause of an increase or what you say some stimulation in the ovarian tissue and therefore the serum gonadotrophin levels will be raised but because the ovarian tissue is not responding it is resistant it is unresponsive it is refractory the serum estradiol levels they will be low if you manage to do a uh, what you say a diagnostic laparoscopy and you take a bit of ovarian tissue for biopsy you will find that the ovarian, uh, there are no follicles, no ovarian follicles present in the ovarian tissue. So, uh, I mean, there are follicles are present, but they are not responding. And the number is also, usually they are not depleted. You will not find any of the graphene follicles and there will be no corpus luteal cysts also. So, the ovaries, they are small streak ovaries. Ovarian biopsy, it's not essential for diagnosis usually. Turner syndrome, the karyotyping, it is either 45XO or it is 45XO, 46XX. Laparoscopically, you will see the streak gonads and the streak, uh, serum gonadotrophins, they will be high. If it is adrenogenital syndrome, that is again karyotyping will help us to know about it. And these are usually very rare cases, therefore, they are being just mentioned in uh, haste. Now, laparoscopy will show that the uterus is absent, tubes are absent, serum testosterone levels, they will be equal to the normal male's level. Karyotyping 46XY, that is an important finding. And when you do the biopsy, you will find testicular tissue. So, it will be an androgen insensitivity syndrome. And in this case, of course, uh, if the ectopic gonads, they are to be removed, the secondary sex, when the sex, secondary sex characters are well developed, then the chances of malignancy are less. Thyroid dysfunction is another cause of amenorrhea, primary amenorrhea. Again, cases of juvenile diabetes, they are also prone to have primary amenorrhea. So, in a nutshell, just remembering, just uh, recollecting the different types of primary amenorrhea patients, they can be either hypergonadotrophic hypogonadism, hypogonadotropic hypogonadism, it can be a case of hyperprolactinemia in which the prolactin levels they are raised. Then normogonadotrophic, but anovulation is there. So normogonadotrophic anovulation. Then chromosomal abnormalities can be there. Mullerian urgenesis, dysfunction of thyroid gland, adrenal gland. Then juvenile diabetes, malnutrition, all these problems are bound to occur. Now, once we have had this discussion on primary amenorrhea, now let's start with the discussion on secondary amenorrhea. Now, what is this secondary amenorrhea? That means that the woman was having menstrual cycles earlier. She was menstruating earlier, but now for the last six months or so, she does not have amenorrhea. So, the definition will include, it is absence of menstruation for six months or more in a woman with previous spontaneous regular cycles. So when the from, uh, previous cycles, they are regular, they are spontaneous. Spontaneous means that she does not have to induce the menstruation by taking some hormones or some exogenous hormones. Still, she is able to menstruate. So if the menstruation, it is absent for six months or more, that is a case of secondary amenorrhea. And also if the previous cycles are irregular, you remember, then the absence of menstruation for a period equal to the duration of three cycles means it is a case of secondary amenorrhea. In other words, we are more worried if the men's previous cycles are irregular because the problem is generally already present. 
but if the cycle uh, three cycles of menstruation are not there we are going to get worried and that will be labeled as a case of secondary amenorrhea but if the previous spontaneous regular cycles are there then we are going to get worried if the absence of menstruation is occurring for 6 months or more now the consequences of course there are many and let's just go through them uh, one by one psychological causes anxiety of course possibility decrease in fertility may be there hypoestrogenism that is important if it is a case of secondary amenorrhea the estrogens are not getting released the levels of estrogens are low the chances of short term problems and long term can be there so if the estrogens are less or they are not there the hot flushes are there night sweats vaginal dryness dyspareunia and urinary symptoms are there in case of short term uh, problem and if it is a long term problem then it can be osteoporosis and coronary heart disease these are very some problems if it is hyperestrogen also along with the secondary amenorrhea because sometimes the estrogen levels they are low sometimes they are high also in spite of the woman having hyper uh, having secondary amenorrhea so if the increased estrogen levels are there that can cause endometrial hyperplasia and chances of increased risk of endometrial cancer are there then hyperinsulinemia another problem in which there is include insulin resistant metabolic syndrome and that is of course is called as polycystic ovarian disease which we will discuss in greater detail later on hirsutism can also be another problem so there can be so many causes of secondary amenorrhea just like causes of primary amenorrhea there are varied and many causes of secondary amenorrhea so if it is physiological the commonest problem in a woman in reproductive age group who has been menstruating regularly but still there is absence i mean there is no menstruation now and she is sexually active also first cause which we should we should have in mind is pregnancy she can be pregnant so any woman any who is sexually active in the reproductive age group you have to think of pregnancy as the first and foremost cause if it is ruled out then we are thinking of the other causes so pregnancy lactation menopause all these are causes physiological causes of secondary amenorrhea in other words that during the reproductive age group or of the woman she is going to have secondary amenorrhea due to natural causes of these pregnancy lactation or menopause and pathological causes it can be any problem in the hypothalamo pituitary ovarian uterine axis just as i had stressed earlier that if the hypothalamo pituitary ovarian uterine axis is normal she is going to menstruate any problem at any of these levels whether it is at the level of the hypothalamus at the level of the pituitary gland the ovaria ovarian tissue or the uterus the if the problem occurs she is going to and she is going to have this phase of secondary amenorrhea other endocrinopathies also so either other endocrine glands may also be involved it can be just non classic congenital adrenal hyperplasia hypothyroidism cushing syndrome all these also cause secondary amenorrhea now let's talk about the hypothalamic causes the hypothalamic causes they are functional hypothalamic amenorrhea it can be stress weight loss weight gain again athletes they can have these phases of secondary amenorrhea then genetic causes granulomas tuberculosis sarcoidosis all these are the hypothalamic causes of secondary amenorrhea stress is a very important cause of secondary amenorrhea the stress of your examination stress of appearing in a some uh, what you say an international event or any com- any competitive games all these can co- have a lot of stress on the mind and if the hypothalamus that is involved in that and that's going this phase of secondary amenorrhea can occur tumors of the hypothalamus can also be responsible for secondary amenorrhea post encephalitis chronic illness trauma all these are known well known causes of secondary amenorrhea what are the features of hypothalamic amenorrhea there is usually a change in the weight or there is a change in the stress levels the woman knows she is stressed out of course so it's quite clear we can understand this phase of her secondary amenorrhea 
Now, lack of LH pulsatility and mid-cycle surge that is there in case of hypothalamic amenorrhea. There is no ovulation in hypothalamic amenorrhea. No low estrogen levels are there and no withdrawal bleeding with progesterone. So you can understand that if the hypothalamus is not releasing the GnRH, the gonadotrophin release hormones, they are not released. The pituitary glands are not going to work. The gonadotrophins are not released. The, they are not going to act over the ovaries. The estrogen progesterones are not released. So all these functions, they are stopped. So there is a lack of the LH pulsatility. There is a mid-cycle surge is not there. So no ovulation, low estrogen levels and no withdrawal bleeding with progesterone. Now pituitary causes of secondary amenorrhea. Pituitary necrosis, Sheehan syndrome, a very important cause of secondary amenorrhea. Then tuberculosis, tumors like pituitary adenomas, they are there. Then hyperprolactinemia, it can be microadenoma, macroadenoma. All these are problems at the level of the pituitary gland. So in this case, the hypothalamus is normal. It's releasing the GnRH or the gonadotrophin release hormones are there. But the pituitary gland, either there is necrosis of the pituitary gland, there is tumor of the pituitary gland. So the pituitary adenoma, hyperprolactinemia, all these are causing this secondary amenorrhea. What are the features of pituitary amenorrhea? It's most often, it's either due to hyperprolactinemia or there can be Sheehan syndrome. These are the usual causes of pituitary amenorrhea. In this case, because the pituitary gland is not working, it's not functioning, the release of the gonadotrophins is not there. So although the GnRH levels may be normal, they may be a little raised also, but because the gonadotrophins are not released, the estrogen levels, they will be low. And uh, you can check the serum pro prolactin levels to find out whether it's hyperprolactinemia. And if you give her exogenous progesterones, there is no withdrawal bleeding. In other words, the progesterone challenge test is negative. Now, what are the ovarian causes of secondary amenorrhea? These are very important. The ovarian causes, that means that the pituitary gland and the hypothalamus are normal. The gonadotrophin release hormone release is okay. The GnR, the gonadotrophins are also released. But at the level of the ovaries, the problem is there. So it can be polycystic ovarian syndrome, PCOS, primary ovarian insufficiency. So the ovarian tissue is not having sufficient follicles. So what happens that there is primary ovarian insufficiency in which the follicles, they are depleted. Then it can the follicle depletion, if it is there, it can be due to either it is chromosomal or autoimmune, chemotherapy, radiotherapy, all these are causes of follicle depletion. And without the follicle depletion also, the primary ovarian failure can occur. Now, the features of amenorrhea due to the ovarian causes. So, the features here, they are quite different from the routine, I mean, uh, due to, they are quite different from the secondary amenorrhea due to problem at the hypothalamus or the pituitary gland. And uh, the commonest cause, of course, is PCOS. The diagnosis is clinical. Clinically, usually you have to make out that the patient is having polycystic ovarian disease. Now, if you do the progesterone challenge test or the progesterone withdrawal bleeding will be there if you give the exogenous progesterones. And uh, second cause it can be primary ovarian insufficiency, which usually is autoimmune. Now, primary ovarian insufficiency, a woman is having, I mean the follicles, they may be either sufficient in amount or due to certain diseases, depletion of the follicles occurs. Suppose she is having a malignancy, she has under, undertaken chemotherapy, radiotherapy, then those follicles can get depleted and she will get primary ovarian insufficiency. Here, the FSH levels will be raised and there is no withdrawal bleeding with progesterone. So the primary ovarian insufficiency, there will be no withdrawal bleeding with progesterones and polycystic ovarian disease, the withdrawal bleeding with progesterones is there. So these two uh, diseases or these two pathologies, they can be easily differentiated by just doing the progesterone challenge test. Now the uterine causes of secondary amenorrhea, there are so many causes of uh, uterine, this uterine causes also. 
the intrauterine adhesions the commonest cause is tuberculosis then it can be if there is an over enthusiastic curettage done so a minor gynecological operation like dnc where you have enthusiastically or i will say more than enthusiastically you have curated and you have removed the endometrium the chances of adhesions of the interior and posterior walls with each other is going to occur the adhesions formations will occur and that will prevent the normal menstrual flow to occur in future then cervical stenosis another cause minor gynecological operations like cervical amputation or conization they can cause cervical stenosis where the internal loss gets closed the external loss gets closed stenosed and the collection of blood will occur within the uterine cavity now the features of the uterine causes of secondary amenorrhea the intrauterine adhesions that is the commonest cause and here if you do the progesterone challenge test that means you are giving her progesterone from exogenous doses of uh, i mean even high doses of progesterone that will not uh, allow any bleeding from the endometrium and there is no withdrawal bleeding so the normal fsh levels the normal lh levels will be otherwise present then the causes of secondary amenorrhea due to endocrinopathies that's another one in which the hypothyroidism can be one of the causes cushing syndrome and the non classical congenital adrenal hyperplasia these are all causes of secondary amenorrhea due to endocrinopathies so these endocrinopathies can also be causing secondary amenorrhea so let's just discuss uh, these problems one by one you can get a note on shehan syndrome it's quite important now shehan syndrome what happens is that the necrosis of the pituitary gland occurs pituitary gland necrosis occurs following postpartum hemorrhage and the resultant hypotension so the woman had a, she delivered a baby either by cesarean or normal delivery after that she went into pph or it means that the excessive bleeding has occurred following uh, the delivery that has caused the woman to go into hypotension or in shock and because the blood supply of the pituitary gland was is also affected necrosis of the pituitary gland occurs so this woman will have pan hypopituitarism involving the thyroid gland and the adrenal gland also so it's not only the pituitary gland which is involved the thyroid gland will be involved the adrenal gland will be involved in fact the woman might forget this pph episode once she gets normal and after several years maybe she lands up in the hospital as an emergency case with recurrent episodes of vomiting and hypotension and you have hospitalized her you have given her iv fluids the woman may not even mention that pph episode you might not even ask her because she is not pregnant at this stage but if you know the problem then you are going to ask her that did you ever had a bad episode of pph following a delivery and of course if she says that will clinch she says yes that will clinch the diagnosis so the shehan syndrome can be diagnosed only if you know about it so the pituitary necrosis has occurred and uh, that due to the shock following the pph and that is responsible for the pituitary gland necrosis and secondary amenorrhea now in this case there will be clinical features of history of failure to lactate the weight loss is there breast atrophy is there depigmentation of the breast areole hypotension symptoms of hypothyroidism so in short if the woman is having secondary amenorrhea accompanied with hypothyroidism and features of this uh, for loss of functioning or what you say decreased functioning of the adrenal glands followed with the weight loss and failure of lactation then you can think of shehan syndrome investigations which will help us that will be low tsh levels low plasma cortisol low serum prolactins low fsh lh and progesterone challenge test will be negative in shehan syndrome so this is quite important a short note can be there on this topic so we should be aware of it second problem which can occur is hyperprolactinemia now hyperprolactinemia that also if it occurs it's usually it presents with amenorrhea secondary amenorrhea and galactorrhea 
and but in some women the galactorrhea is not there she is just having secondary amenorrhea and pathophysiology what causes this secondary amenorrhea if the serum prolactin levels are raised why will it cause secondary amenorrhea just let us go into that discussion also now prolactin it is inhibited by the hypothalamus through dopamine the release of dopamine from the hypothalamus is going to affect inhibit it is going to have a negative feedback on the release of prolactin so the hypothalamus which is functioning normally will release the dopamine which will have an inhibitory control over the prolactins and that is the usual physiology now serotonin and thyrotropin releasing hormones they are also stimulators of prolactin so thyrotropin release hormones is stimulating prolactin release serotonin is also releasing it but inhibition is by dopamine now hyperprolactinemia it is associated with reduction in gnrh and gonadotropin production through direct effect on the hypothalamus and pituitary now this hyperprolactinemia so which is under the inhibitory control of the dopamine and it if the levels increase due to some problem then the either the effect of serotonin or thyrotropin release hormones now if this hyperprolactinemia is there that's going to reduce the production of gnrh and gonadotropin production through the direct effect on the hypothalamus and the pituitary now secondary to the gonadotropin deficiency the estrogen levels are low and the progesterone challenge test that is negative now what are the causes of hyperprolactinemia it can be physiological causes can be like it can be stress pregnancy lactation of course lactation you can understand the serum prolactin levels will be raised and that will cause a secondary amenorrhea certain drugs are also responsible for hyperprolactinemia certain antihypertensives like alpha methyl dopa verapamil risperdal all these drugs can cause secondary amenorrhea due to hyperprolactinemia antipsychotics now phenothiazine haloperidol risperidone tricyclic antidepressants all these are also causing hyperprolactinemia and secondary amenorrhea dopamine receptor antagonist now you can understand that those uh, antagonist drugs which are uh, which are acting which are preventing or inhibiting the dopamine receptor receptors that's going to produce hyperprolactinemia like metoclopramide that can cause this problem certain pathological conditions hypothyroidism can be there one of them something important prolactinomas now microadenomas and macroadenomas these are tumors of the pituitary gland these can cause problems then hypothalamic and pituitary tumors of course that's a region only so microadenoma macroadenoma hypothalamic pituitary tumors they can cause hyperprolactinemia normal serum prolactins we take it as less than 25 nanogram per ml so if the levels are less than 25 nanogram per ml then we are safe now if serum tsh is elevated primary hypothyroidism is diagnosed and the thyroxine therapy is started and if the serum hypothyroidism is ruled out then of course we have to see that the prolactin levels if they are between 25 to 75 nanogram per ml we have to find out first of all whether it's a functional hyperprolactinemia or it is drug induced prolactin levels between 75 and 200 nanogram per ml that is worrisome microprolactinoma can be there or it can be some stock compression by non functional pituitary tumors drug induced but if the prolactin levels are more than 200 nanogram ml the first cause which we can think of is prolactinomas it can be microadenoma macroadenoma that is worrisome the treatment of course we have, if the levels they are between 75 to 200 nanogram the drugs we are going to inhibit it with giving her drugs and the commonest drug which we are giving is capgolin it is given on on almost a weekly dose or a biweekly dose of capgolin will be given which is usually given either as 0.5 mg or 1 mg that will induce that will stop or what you say it will inhibit the high the raised pre pro, uh, this prolactin levels if it is prolactin levels are more than 200 nanogram ml per ml then the we have worried because of the all the pituitary tumors microadenoma macroadenoma which may be responsible for so that we have to do a detailed checkup of course your uh, neurologist will be 
more helpful in in diagnosing all these problems visual fields are checked and of course you are go going to do further management imaging of the pituitary with ct scan or mri will be done so with this we are coming to the end of this topic if we are having a woman of secondary amenorrhea you always remember that if she is a case of uh, if she is in the reproductive age group sexually active the first problem which we can think of problem we won't say problem because it's a physiological condition it can be pregnancy then it can be lactation that we should always keep in mind and if after that the pathology is if we are going through the pathology remember the commonest in the reproductive age group will be polycystic ovarian disease which we will be discussing next time okay thank you so much